hermetic call from out of the past. Stories, strange and weird. Tales of mystery and terror by radio's masters of the macabre. Stories of the supernatural, the supernormal, dramatizing the fact, the mystery, the unknown. We tell you this frankly, so if you wish to avoid the excitement and tension of these magnets, play, we urge you, only, seriously, to turn off your way. Welcome back to the horror. Thanks for joining me this Saturday. We're going to hear this week from The Witch's Tale, a series that originally aired from May of 1931 to June of 1938. These have to be some of the earliest examples of old-time radio horror. The series produced over 300 episodes, originally aired over mutual stations, then in syndication. Our story today is The Bronze Venus from July 11th, 1932. Bring you the witch's tale, written and produced by Alonzo Dean Cole. And now let us join old Nancy and Satan, her wise black cat. <laughs> Hannah and two-year-old I be today. Yes, sir, Hannah and two-year-old. Well, Satan, what kind of a chair for a little yarn will we spin these folks tonight? A love story? Well, if you ain't a sentimental old cat. You say you're not too old to be romantic? (laughs) I never knowed a male critter that was in his mind. Now set yourself down in the corner, Satan, and I'll spin the kind of tale you ask for. But douse out them lights, everybody. Nancy's love yarns is best listened to in the darkness. Now draw up to the fire. And gaze into the embers. Soon you'll see inside a happy home across the seas in France. It's down in the country where them old heathen roamings used to live 2,000 years ago. And while they left some funny things lying buried in the earth. Funny things <laughs> that men today sometimes discover. Gaze into them buzz deep and hear our yarn of the bronze Venus. <laughs> the bronze Venus. <laughs> Mama, Howie should be here any minute. If you don't hurry, I shan't be dressed in time to meet him. Stop squirming if you want me to finish. <laughs> oh, I'll be glad when Henri takes you off my hands. Then I won't have to tie ribbons on a creature who can't stand still a moment. <laughs> you won't be glad at all. You'll weep constantly after I'm married and go to live in Paris. I shan't shed a single tear. The sooner such a nuisance as you is out of my sight, the better. Oh, my baby, you will be leaving me soon. Mama, stop that. My little Georgia. Stop it or I'll cry too. Mama, please don't. No, I mustn't. Anyone who saw me would think a funeral was to take place here in five days instead of a wedding. And I'm really very happy. Your Henri is a good man. He, he loves you and, and you love him. Oh, so much, Mama. <sighs> so much. Stop your sighing and, and let me finish with these ribbons. Oh, I suppose I sighed the same foolish way before I married your father... 
And that's the only thing I have against Henri. He's so much like your father. Why, Mom? In his ridiculous interest, I mean. How the daughter of an antiquary can ever wish to become the wife of one is quite beyond my comprehension. Oh, <laughs> you really don't mean that. With all his constant delving among old ruins and buried cities, Papa has remained as close and dear to you as Henri will be to me. Yes, of course, physically. But I long ago discovered that to a man with the archaeological bee in his bonnet, no mere woman can compete spiritually with a thousand-year-old trifle that he's dug up from the earth. And I don't approve of such work. I never have. It's, it's too much like robbing graves. Mama. To my mind, the dead and their possessions are best left undisturbed. Oh, that's silly superstition. All right, have it your own way. <laughs> but I do wish Papa hadn't found something to disturb this morning. He should have gone to meet Henri instead of merely sending old Jacques to the station with the carriage. Henri won't be annoyed by that apparent rudeness when he learns it was caused by a new discovery. Chances are he'll even forget he's been away from you for an entire month while he and your father indulge in scientific raptures. Oh, oh not Henri. We'll see. What is it your father found this morning? You haven't told me much about it yet. Oh, oh it gave me an awful fright. Fright? For just a moment. This sign was purely accidental. Three of our peasants were digging up that old olive tree that was frozen last winter, and Papa and I were standing beside them, <laughs> talking about Hurry. When one of the men dug his pick into the earth, and we heard a bong, as though he'd struck a bell. Then, suddenly, a black hand seemed to rise from out the earth. I thought it was a dead man's at first. <laughs> but it was only the hand of a bronze statue. And when I left, Papa was delirious with joy and down in the pit with a shovel, helping the man unearth the rest of it. <laughs> oh, then he'll be covered with dirt when he returns to the house. And he'll track it all over my carpets. Oh, but what's the use? I discovered long ago that men can't be made over. Whoa, Sarah, whoa. Oh, Mama, that's old Jacques outside. The carriage is returned with hurry. Georgette. Georgette. Here, Mama. He's here. I'm right behind you. Corey, Corey. Georgette, darling. Oh, my little sweetheart. Good afternoon, Henri. Welcome back. Madame de Marseille, I salute you. Don't waste your kisses on an old woman such as I. But tell this girl of mine how much you've missed. Oh, I already know, Mama. For I know how greatly I've missed him. Have you, dear? To me, every moment that I've been away has seemed an hour. The hour's like days, the days as years. That's a very pretty speech for an antiquary. I hope that after your marriage, you won't neglect to tell Georgette the same charming lies. Lies? Ma oh. <laughs> your mother's only joking, dear. She knows that nothing is important in my life, excepting you. Hello, Georgette. Oh, here comes your father, Georgette, covered with dirt from head to foot. Henri, Henri, you have arrived. Just now, Monsieur de Marseille. And no thanks to you, Francois. You should be ashamed you didn't meet him at the station. Oh, I have been doing something more important, something that will make Henri's eyes grow wide with envy. You've unearthed the statue, Papa? Um, the men are bringing it. Just wait until you see statue? it. Statue? What statue? Didn't you, Georgette, tell you of my find? Henri oh, just stepped from the carriage. Besides, I don't yet know what you found. I left before... Wait until you see. Hurry, hurry, you men. It looks as though they were bearing a corpse. Now, handle it carefully there. Now, now, now place it up right there. Monsieur de Marseille. Why, it's an antique bronze. Yes, a life-size bronze of Venus. A Venus of the ancients. Where did you find her? How did you... <laughs> Look at her, my boy. Oh. And envy me my luck. This statue may prove the greatest find of the century. She's gorgeous. Superb. A masterpiece. Monsieur de... Monsieur, she's of the early Roman period. Her face is not the classic style. Oh, no. Here you have none of the immobility of feature which the Greeks gave to their sculpture. Her face seems almost living. I've never seen such an illusion of life and metal. She, she has such a cruel face. Hasn't she a heartless beauty, though? If she were a living woman, Henri, how she'd make her lover suffer. <laughs> she'd send a man to death without the slightest pity. Yes. She's almost devilish in her charm. She's the loveliest thing I've ever seen. That's a fine thing for a prospective husband to say in the presence of his future wife. Well, I, I hardly think Georgette will be jealous of Henri's compliments to a statue. Helene, what an excellent omen. She is for these children. Five days before their marriage, I bring them Venus, the goddess of love. Excellent omen indeed. A heathen idol buried by the dead. I don't like her looks at all. Oh, well, you have no appreciation. Henri, Georgette. We must take full advantage of this excellent portrait. Your marriage was to be on Saturday. Friday is Venus Day. You are not suggesting their wedding to be advanced to Friday. Certainly. Georgette, that's a whole day sooner. Never. A 
A marriage on Friday would bring all sorts of bad fortune. On the contrary, it will bring only good. For my goddess on the earth will smile upon their union. Mama, I'd like to be married that much sooner. Oh, and I, Madame de Marseille. Well, I suppose one superstition is as foolish as the other. All right. Oh, there. It's all settled. Jean Cole, you and the men fetch scraping tools. Yes, monsieur. Now, honey, you and I will remove the encrusted earth from my Venus. We may find inscriptions. Yes. No, you may scrape in the dirt all you wish, but not all. Oh, but it will be a privilege, madame. Oh, this find is stupendous. Every archaeologist in France will go mad with envy when they hear of it. And since monsieur has offered to you let see, me share... You see, Georgette, what you must expect from an antiquary? Your affianced husband, whom you've not seen for a month, would desert you the hour he returns for a dead thing out of the earth. Oh, madame, you know I... You may help Papa if you wish, Henri. I'm going in the house. Oh, darling, wait. Forgive my thoughtlessness. I won't touch the statue or even think about it. Instead, you and I will take a stroll in the garden and talk. What was that sound? Oh, it came from inside my Venus. Some loose fragment in a hollow form must have fallen and struck against the metal sides. <laughs> Coming as it did, Ollie, <laughs> it seemed to protest against your desertion of her. <laughs> well, protest or not, I am deserting her. Well, run along, then. Ari, when you and Georgia to reach the garden, try to act like a lover instead of an archaeologist. I'm going in the house. <laughs> I shall take your advice, madame. Come, Georgia. Oh, uh, later, if your daughter permits, monsieur... I shall be delighted to return and help you. I shall be delighted to have you, madam. You'd rather stay with that old statue now than be with me. You know I wouldn't, darling. And you shouldn't feel bitterness toward anything that's been so kind to us. I just think she's advanced our marriage a day. You don't believe, as Mama does, that Friday is unlucky. If your love for me is as strong as mine for you, nothing can be unlucky. Dear, see what I brought you from Paris. That ring upon your little finger? Uh-huh. Oh, gorgeous. Let me put no, it on. No, no, not yet. It will only leave my finger for that of my wife's. It won't be yours for four whole days. It's to be my wedding ring. Yes. There's a Latin inscription inside that means yours forever. You shall be mine. And I will be yours forever. After Friday. Just four short days. <sighs> but they'd seem terribly long if your father hadn't found that statue. Fortunately, I can occupy my time assisting him with her. Henry, you're thinking more about that statue than you do of me. George, Mama was right. To such men as you and Papa, nothing matters but dead things from the earth. I hate your ugly Venus. I hate her. Hate her. What? <laughs> what was that? What? That sound. Henry. It came from that statue back there. Oh. Well, your father, Jean Carl, must have struck it with a tool. I suppose so. But as she seemed to protest against you leaving her a while ago, now she seemed to answer what I said in anger. <laughs> you silly little goose. Well, if you, th if you think she has understanding, I'll anger her still more. Do you think I could give that ancient lump of metal a single thought when you are near? If she were the living Venus, goddess of beauty... To me, you'd be more beautiful. And I'd love you more than Venus, the living goddess of love. That sound again. Someone call. Help, help. Papa. He's hidden by those trees. Run. Papa, hold on. Oh, he's, he's not hurt, thank heaven. The Venus is falling. And a man lies on the ground beside Monsieur him. Monsieur de Marseille, what has happened? The statue fell upon Jean Cole. He's, he's not. Oh, he's only stunned, I think. He's breathing. Georgette, send Jacques for Dr. Babouche. At once. But how did it happen? I don't know. For no reason at all, my Venus toppled over. And oh, oh my, my old eyes are playing tricks. What do you mean? Well, before she fell, it seemed her bronze arm struck out in rage, blindly. As a person of temper strikes when something is said to anger them. Henry, it happened when you said you loved me more. That ain't the end of our love story about the bronze Venus, Satan. But if these folks wants to hear the rest about her, they got to come and see us next time and has a birthday. Hunnin' four-year-old, I be real soon. Hunnin' and four-year-old. <laughs>
And now let us join old Nancy and Satan, our wise black cat. Hannah, an 11-year-old, I be today. Yes, sir, Hannah, an 11-year-old. But instead of celebrating my birthday with a good rest, Satan, we got to go to work and tell the finish of that pretty love story we begun last time these folks was here. Let's see. You keep track of our romantic yarn, Satan. Where'd we leave off? That's right. We told about that nice young girl who was fixing to marry a young archaeologist fella and how the girl's father, who was also in the archaeology business, discovered the statue of a heathen goddess that was buried in the earth. It was an awful lifelike looking statue. <laughs> and right while we left off our yarn, it seemed as if it had got mad and struck a man with its metal fist. Douse out them lights so we'll have it nice and dark for the finish of our tale. Now draw up to the fire and gaze into the embers. Gaze into them deep, and soon you'll be back with us in France while once them heathen roamings lived. Soon you'll see once more the bronze Venus. <laughs> the bronze Venus. <laughs> it's an ill wind that blows no one good on it. If it hadn't been for Jean-Paul's bruises, Madame de Marseille would never have permitted you to help me complete this delightful task of scraping the encrusted earth from my Venus. <laughs> She's used to me getting dirty, but she doesn't want our future son-in-law to follow in my sinful footsteps. Well, if I didn't help you, no one else would. Your goddess has certainly struck terror into the peasants around here. They won't come within a hundred meters of her now, even though Jean-Paul is far from dead as he claimed to be when he came to. <laughs> oh, dear, dear. Very strange the way that accident occurred. I must consult an oculist about my eyes. I could have sworn the statue's arm lashed out in blind rage and struck him. Mm -hmm. Georgette still maintains the reason for that rage was something I said about your beautiful bronze lady. Oh, it's all too ridiculous. Of course it is. Um, well, we're progressing splendidly. The upper part of my Venus is quite clean now. She's a gorgeous thing, your Venus. You admire her as I do. This divinity dug from the earth. Yes. It's easy to understand why men of long ago adored her. You and I are pagans at heart. We could adore her now. Yes. We could adore her now. Look at her. The bronze seems to glow as we pay tribute to her beauty. One could almost fancy that she smiled. Georgette and her mother are right. There is an illusion of life about this figure that's often startling. Yes. Oh, it's caused by shadows in the sun, I suppose. It couldn't be anything else. Oh, confound it. What's the matter? This ring. It's so thick and heavy, I can't hold the scraper properly. That's the wedding ring you're to give Georgette on Friday, Venus Day. Yes. <laughs> you owe me a debt of gratitude for advancing your marriage to that afternoon. Finding this lovely goddess was too good an omen to be disregarded. I can't work any longer with this ring on. It's cutting into my flesh. Just take it off. Where shall I put it? What's the matter with your pocket? Well, there's... There's a hole in each of them. <laughs> I'm still a bachelor, you know. I see the perfect place. The statue's outstretched finger. Perfect. And another good omen, Ori. Your wedding ring will be blessed by the goddess of love herself. Now, well, that they're out of the way, I can certainly use my hand more freely. <laughs> but beware, Ori. With that ring on her finger, Venus may think you've married her. <laughs> Fortunately, the thoughts of a bronze lady are very unimportant. Oh, but for that face, if she were more than bronze, what a jealous fiction she'd be. And inside that ring is inscribed in Latin, yours forever. Latin was her language. Well, I refuse to worry about that. Say, we must be getting to work in earnest if we hope to find an inscription. If there is one, it'll be here from the base where I'm working. We should have begun there. It was your idea to clean the upper body first. I know. I wanted to see how she really looked. She was so beautiful, even underneath the dirt. So beautiful. So beautiful. Sorry. 
Well, Georgette is coming to join us. Darling, I thought you said you wouldn't come near our goddess again. I don't want to, but I'm not going to let her take you and Papa away from me altogether. (laughs) Sweetheart, as though anything could take me away from you for long. Don't. Please don't say anything nice to me when she's so close. Georgette. I know, I'm foolish. It must have been coincidence that Jean Cole was hurt by her when you said you cared more for me, but... I'm afraid of her somehow. But that's so utterly ridiculous. Polly, look. What? An inscription. No. My scraper just uncovered Oh, so let's see. Where? Here, here. Now we shall learn something of my Venus's history. It's badly worn. Very faint. You can make it out with your young eyes. I think I can. Yes. It reads... Cave Amantum. Cave Amantum. That can be translated, Beware of him who loves you. No, 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 no. Wait. The more likely translation is... Look out for herself, yourself... If she loves you. You're right. That's it. That's it. It's no more. Not another word. Look out for yourself if she loves you. No, that doesn't tell us very much. Oh, yes. It does. Hurry. Come away. Don't stay near her any longer. But Georgia. Oh, please, please. Keep away from her. She's more than metal. She looks almost alive. And she's bad, cruel. Oh. oh darling. My child. My ring. My wedding ring is on her finger. Oh, well, it, it impeded my work. I you thought it said that... it would only leave your finger for that of your wife's. And she has well, it. She's only a statue. She's more than that. She's the symbol of a goddess. People built temples to her. She was worshipped, honored, feared. Her worshippers are dead. But maybe thoughts don't die. Perhaps the shadow of their faith still lives. Perhaps the power it gave her lives. My child, such talk is madness. I don't care if it is. Hurry. Don't let her have my wedding ring. Well, I'll, I'll get it at once, dear, since you wish it. How quick. Hurry. What's the matter? Oh, it's... It's stuck. It won't come off. Oh, poor heart. I am. Something has changed here. Changed? Yes. When I slipped the ring on, this finger was straight. Venus has closed her hand. She won't give back your wedding ring. Francois, come in here and shut the door. We shouldn't leave our guests just before the wedding. Wedding? It's more as though a a funeral were to take place here today. It's this storm that that has depressed everybody's spirits. No, you know what's caused it. Because the hand of my statue was accidentally bent so that ring can't be taken off. There's no reason for everyone to be in a state of superstitious terror. I've been your wife for nearly 30 years, Francois. You can't hide your fears from me. I, Helene, I, I... You know the metal finger that no file can touch was not accidentally bent. I don't know how it Oh, happened. what are we going to do? Henri has acted like a man in trance today. It's as though some awful spell was on him. Georgette is pale and trembling. She looks ghastly in her bridal dress. Fear is eating all our hearts. Oh, there's nothing to be afraid of, nothing. We've simply imagined things, that's all. We imagine things now. Not imaginations play us tricks. That pagan goddess in our garden is not imagination. I can see her from this window, and as the lightning plays about her, she looks like some fiend of hell. But she's only a metal statue, just a metal statue that can't do any harm. Listen. Francois, that sound is coming from your Venus. Oh, it's it's caused by the rain beating it to copper size. It's been raining for hours. We haven't heard that sound before. Oh, it's, it's, it's raining harder now. That must be the reason for that sound. There's nothing else to cause it. It's growing louder, as though she wanted someone to hear. As though she was calling someone. Elaine, you're talking madness. Oh, Francois, I'm so afraid for Georgette and the man she loves. My dear. Come in. Madame. Monsieur, your presence is required. The cure is ready to begin the ceremony. We should come at once, Mary. Yes, monsieur. Dry your tears, Elaine. Everything will be all right. Come, my dear. The cure is waiting for us. Yes, waiting to perform a marriage on Friday, Venus Day. Henri Michel de Saint Clair, wilt thou take Georgette Cecile de Marseille here present for thy lawful wife, according to the right of our Holy Mother the Church? Aye. I will. Georgette Cécile de Marseille, wilt thou take Henri Michel de Saint Clair here present for thy lawful husband, according to the right of our Holy Mother of the Church? I will. 
Join your right hands and repeat after me. I, Henri Michel de Saint Clair, take thee, Georgette Cécile de Marseille, for my lawful wife. I, Henri Michel de Saint Clair, take thee, Georgette Cécile de Marseille, for my lawful Henri. wife. To have and to hold from this day forward. To have and to hold from this day forward. For better, for worse, for richer, for poorer. For better, for worse, for richer, for poorer. In sickness and in health, until death do us part. In sickness and in health, until... Until... Henry! Until death! 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 No! Venus, I am yours forever! Henry! Venus! Your bridegroom is coming to you. Stop him. Henri, come back. We ran out of that storm. He's going to that statue. Oh. That statue is moving. His arms reach out to clasp him. Your bridegroom, Venus, has come for his embrace. He's in her metal arms. She's crushing him to death. Henri. Henri, my darling. Georgette. Henri. Henri, my sweetheart. <laughs> Venus Day, Venus Day, Venus Day. Another perky love story to tell ya. For this week, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. You can find more from The Witch's Tale at relicradio.com. Alongside thousands of other old-time radio episodes, all the other podcasts, our shoutcast stream, and everything else Relic Radio. You can help support this show through the website as well, or visit donate.relicradio.com. Your support is how all of this is made possible. Thanks to those who have been able to help out. Thanks for joining me today. Talk to you again next Saturday with another episode of The Horror. RelicRadio.com presents tales of the strange and bizarre, the weird and the wicked. Stories not necessarily of the supernatural, but of the unnatural. Join us now for Strange Tales, featuring radio drama at its most mysterious and unusual.
This is Strange Tales. Welcome back. Thanks for joining me this Sunday. We're going to hear from the Mysterious Traveler this week, a mutual series that debuted in December of 1943. It aired until September of 1952, over 300 episodes. Our story today is from July 6th, 1948. It's titled, The Man Who Vanished. Mutual Broadcasting System presents The Mysterious Traveler, written, produced, and directed by Robert A. Arthur and David Cogan, and starring tonight, two stars of stage and radio, Wendell Holmes and Roger DeCoven, in an original radio drama titled, The Man Who Vanished. This is The Mysterious Traveler inviting you to join me on another journey into the realm of the strange and the terrifying. I hope you will enjoy the trip, that it will thrill you a little and chill you a little. So settle back, get a good grip on your nerves, and be comfortable, if you can, as you hear the story I call The Man Who Vanished. story begins in a small, white-walled hospital room. Charles Ordway, a man of 45, has just awakened. He looks about him in puzzlement. Then memory returns to him, and he begins to call frantically. Doctor! Doctor! Nurse! Where are you? I must speak to the doctor! Yes, Mr. Ordway, what is it? Are you the doctor? No, sir, I'm only the attendant. You want to speak to Dr. Harvey? Yes, yes, I must. I must. It's a matter of life and death. Okay, Mr. Ordway, okay. Dr. Harvey, 402, please. He's coming now. Sir. Thank you. Tell me what day is this. It's, it's Friday, isn't it? It must be Friday. Sure, sure. It's Friday, Mr. Ordway. Here's Dr. Harvey now. Yeah, good morning, Mr. Ordway. You uh, wanted to speak to me? Yes, doctor, but tell me quickly, what time is it? Uh, it's just uh, ten minutes past ten, Mr. Ordway. Oh, thank heavens. My brother John isn't dead. There's still time to save him. Your brother? Yes, doctor. When I when I woke up, I didn't know how long it was since I was, I was brought here to the hospital and drugged into silence, but I don't suppose they told you about John. I'm afraid they didn't. Well, then I'll tell you. I'll make you believe me. John's safe for several hours yet, so I can tell you the whole story. The story they wouldn't give me a chance to tell. Yes, go right ahead, Mr. Ordway. I'll just sit here and make myself comfortable. Well, I'll try to tell it calmly, Doctor. I don't want you to think I'm hysterical. First of all, You have to understand that my brother John is a freak of nature. A freak? Yes. He's perfectly healthy and highly intelligent, but he was born without any natural coloring at all. His eyes are pink. His skin is a chalk white. His hair is like bleached flax. His eyebrows and lashes are practically invisible. It's a most unusual condition, but it uh, happens once in a while. It's called albinism. Well, it's a hideous condition for an intelligent, sensitive man. John's boyhood was a torture for him until our father took us both out of school and had us tutored to spare John the misery of being considered a freak of nature by by the other children. Yes, I understand, Mr. Ordway. Please, go on. Well, as we grew up, John's chief interest was science. So I studied it, too. Our father had a complete laboratory built in our home. After his death, we continued to live there together, working on experimental research. Along what lines, Mr. Ordway? Well, our efforts were centered on discovering a cure for John's condition. To achieve that, we worked hopefully for years. But we always failed. My brother remained outwardly calm, but inwardly he began to brood. Then, one evening, he came into my room. Uh, Charles. Yes, John. Finished in the lab? In a way, Charles. I have something to show you. Show me? You mean you found a cure? Not exactly. Look at this wire cage. Examine the white rat I have in it. White rat? Oh, good 
Careful. This morning, that was an ordinary white rat. But now look at it. It's like a rat made out of glass. It, it, it's almost transparent. It is transparent. You can see completely through it. But John, this is amazing. This is what I've been working on these last months, Charles. I've been developing a serum that would alter living tissues to make them transparent. I wouldn't have believed it possible. I don't see why not. Nature does it all the time. She makes jellyfish that are quite transparent. Oh, yes, of course. I, I didn't think. But this is only the first step. My next step is to develop the serum further. To make living tissues invisible. Invisible? <laughs> you look skeptical, my dear Charles. But look at this rat. He's half invisible already. In a dim light, he'd vanish. Yes, that, that's true, but... Mm -hmm. The basic principle is perfectly natural, Charles. It's only a matter of refining it. And then, Charles... Well, take a freak like myself. So colorless, he's already well started toward invisibility. I'll find out what it's like to be completely unseen. Someday soon, Charles. I'm going to have a real surprise for you. That was my first introduction to John's experiment. After that, for many weeks, he worked in secret. Then one morning, he called me into the laboratory and showed me a cage that seemed to be empty, but there was something scurrying about it, a rat, an invisible rat. To the touch, it was warm and furry, filled with life. But to the eye, if the light was not too bright, it was nothing. Well, Charles, convinced now? Yes, yes, I'm convinced. You... You succeeded, John. Not quite. I haven't made myself invisible yet. Well, you're not going to try your serum on yourself. Of course I am. Listen, Charles. Always I've been considered a freak. Now I'm going to turn the tables. I'll mingle with people and, and I'll laugh at them. I'll be their superior, able to come and go without their knowledge. Able to control their very destinies, if I wish. John, that's mad. On the contrary, it's scientific fact. You'll see, because you're going to help me. No, I, I Surely, refuse. You're not going to let me down, your own brother. Well, of course, John. I knew I'd. I could get your help. Here's a uh, hypodermic full of the serum. All I want you to do is to inject it into my arm and watch the result. I tried to refuse, but John wouldn't let me. At last, I gave in. I injected the colorless serum into his veins. At first, nothing happened. As we waited, he removed his garments, for of course the serum could only affect his living tissues. Finally, the change came. His skin became paler and paler, until suddenly I realized I was looking not at it, but through it. After that, the change was rapid. His body seemed to fade away before my eyes into nothing. Well, Charles, what do you say now? Oh, John, this frightens me. Why should it? I feel fine. In fact, I feel so good, I'm going to take a little jaunt downtown to see how the world looks to a man who's invisible. No, no, you mustn't. And why not, Charles? Well, you, you aren't ready for it yet. There, there may be after effects, reactions you aren't prepared for. Ah, nonsense. There's only one thing to be careful of. The tissues must return to normal within 24 hours. If the neutralizing serum isn't injected before then, uh, death occurs. Otherwise, it's perfectly safe. So I insist, Charles, that I'm going on a little invisible sightseeing tour tonight. And you're going to conduct me. Again, I tried to say no, but John was insistent. At last I gave in. His was always the stronger will. We took the car and I drove downtown. He sat beside me. Unseen as the very air, laughing to himself. <laughs> John! John, let's turn back now. Turn back, I should say not. Drive to Main Street and park around the corner from the Watson jewelry store. The one where our old schoolboy companion, Harry Watson, works for his father? Well, why, John? Because I'm going to try an interesting little experiment. That's why. John was in a strange mood, and I obeyed his orders with misgivings. I parked the car as he directed, and we got out and stood on the sidewalk, with the evening crowds drifting past us, completely unaware of John at my side. Suddenly, John spoke. Now's the time, Charles. There's nobody in the store but Harry Watson himself. Come on, we're going in. Ask Harry to show you some stopwatches. Uh, keep him occupied, and don't worry about me. But what are you going to do? Never mind. Just do as I say. Whatever happens, pretend not to notice. Come on. 
Open the door. Oh, hello, Charles. Can I help you? Well, I- I'd uh, like to look at a stopwatch, Harry. Stopwatch? Of course. They're over here. Here's a beauty, Charles. This Swiss chronograph is timed to one one-hundredth of a second. I, uh, I'm afraid it'd be too expensive. Huh? Well, perhaps you'd like this one. It's American-made, and it... What was that? What was what? I heard a noise in the back of the store. I didn't hear anything. There it is again. There's someone back there. But there, there can't be. There's nothing in sight. Oh, just the same. I think there's someone back there. Excuse me. I was putting away some valuable diamonds when you come in, and I've got to see about them. He hurried back into the shadowy rear of the store. I held my breath. If he should bump into John. Then I heard Watson cry out. I've got to your feet. No. Uh, you're not going to get away. What are you doing? Help! Charles! Help me! Help! John! John, what's happened? Come on, quickly. We have to get out of here. What happened? The fool bumped into me in the shadows. He was so excited he didn't even realize he couldn't see me. I used a paper knife I picked up and taught him a little lesson. He's not dead. Come on, we've got to get out of here. Someone may have heard him. We got out of the store and to the car. As I drove home, John refused to answer any of my frantic questions. When we reached the house, he hurried me into the laboratory. You've got to give me the neutralizer or make me visible again, Charles. But John! No questions. Here we are. Here's the hypodermic. You've got to inject it. Here, here's the mark from the previous injection. Now go ahead. I pressed the plunger. The drug flowed into his blood. For a moment, nothing happened. Then, like a man materializing out of nothingness, he grew visible. A misty figure that took on solidity until it was a man. John gave a little gasp of weariness and pushed me out of the room. Go on, Charles. You get to bed. I need some sleep. This stuff seems to drain away my energy. We'll talk in the morning. Pleasant dreams. The next morning, I was having breakfast when John finally appeared. Ah, Good morning, Charles. Sleep well? John, look at this newspaper. Uh, Anything in it? Yes, there's something in it. Look at these headlines. I see. Local jeweler kills, store up $50,000 worth of diamonds missing. You killed Harry last night. Yes, so it seems. Uh, Pour me some coffee, will you? John, I don't understand you. You've killed a man and you act as if it amounted no more than than swatting a fly. Well, does it? Of course it does. I can't feel that way about it. When we were small boys, you remember that Harry Watson was one of my chief tormentors. Yes, I've always planned to pay him back. Last night I decided to play a little joke on him. Murder is hardly a joke. I didn't intend to kill the fool. I just meant to make away with one or two of his father's diamonds. After Harry had had a chance to explain their disappearance, I was going to mail them back. Yes, it's diamonds. The paper says $50,000 worth of missing. Oh, probably an exaggeration. However, put your hand into your left coat pocket, Charles. What? 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 A dozen loose diamonds here. Yes, I put them there last night. I couldn't very well carry them myself. We must send them back at once. Well, I'm afraid that might involve us somehow. No, uh, uh, we'll have to keep them. John, what's happened to you? Overnight you've become a, a monster, able to dismiss the worst of crimes with a shrug. Please understand this, Charles. For years I was an object of curiosity. I even had offers to appear in sideshows. Now the tables are turned. I can walk among men unseen, invisible. That gives me a power that is very sweet to me. I haven't decided yet how I shall use it. But in any case, I won't have you interfering. Is that clear, Charles? With that, John retired to his laboratory and remained there alone the rest of the day. It wasn't until after dark that he emerged to find me staring with horror at the evening paper. Oh, Charles, what does the paper say? It made you look so pale. The police found your fingerprints on the knife that killed Harry Watson. What? Let me see it. Here. That's the police investigating the murder last night of Harry Watson, local jeweler's son state they are trying to trace down fingerprints found on the paper knife used as the death weapon. They also admit they have discovered further evidence which they hope may bring about an early arrest. They may be here any minute. Ah, nonsense. 
Even if I did leave a print, how can they trace it to me? I should talk to them early. Arrest is just bluff. And besides, we... That may be the police now. If it is, what do we do? Oh, it can't be. But if it is, let them in. Uh, let me do the talking. All right. Yes, what is it? Mr. Charles Ordway? Yes, I'm Charles Ordway. I'm Inspector Long of the Homicide Squad. I'd like to ask you some questions, if you don't mind. Oh, uh, no, no, not at all. Come in. We can talk in the living room. What is it, Charles? Uh, John, this is Inspector Long. He says he wants to ask me some questions. Really? What in the world about? I don't know. I confess, Inspector, I can't imagine what... I want to ask you what you can tell me about the death of Harry Watson. Uh, Watson the jeweler? The one we were reading about in the paper? That's the one. Your brother was seen leaving the jewelry store a few minutes before Watson's body was found. Someone recognized him. Why, yes, that's true, Inspector. Charles dropped in last night to buy a watch for me. But he didn't find quite what I wanted. I'd rather hear him tell it. Well, that's all there is to it. I I looked at the watches and then left. Watson was all right when I left him. I see. Was no one else in the store? No one I could see. I'm sorry, I can't tell you more. I'm sorry, too. Well, just for the sake of helping us, would you be willing to let me take your fingerprints? Well, uh, Uh, of course you don't mind, Charles. You're thinking of the prints the paper says were found on the death weapon, aren't you, Inspector? Frankly, yes. (laughs) Well, they aren't, Charles. I can assure you. It's just a check. Here, Mr. Ordway, if you'll just press your fingerprints against this gelatin plate I have in this envelope. Like this? That's right. Thank you. You wouldn't want mine, too, I suppose. Well, if you'd like to add yours to your brother's... <laughs> well, I was just joking. By the way, Inspector, how do you go about tracing down unknown fingerprints such as those of this killer? Well, this is one way, and... Uh, excuse me, a cigarette? Oh, thanks. Yeah, you asking how we check fingerprints? Well, we have several methods. The FBI records, the uh, Army and Navy records, and the one source few people know about. Oh, what's that? Hospital birth records. For a number of years now, they've recorded the footprints and fingerprints of every baby born in this city. In the morning, we'll start checking these records as far back as they go. Oh, that's very interesting. Well, sorry, Inspector, we uh, couldn't be more helpful. It's all in the game. Good night, gentlemen. Good night, Inspector. Now, don't bother to show me up. Did you hear that? They're going to start checking fingerprints on hospital birth records. And our prints were among the first ever to be recorded in this town. Father insisted on it. Perhaps they'll overlook you. Was... I can't risk it. But I'll stop them. I'll stop them somehow. Without explaining, he hurried into the laboratory. Ten minutes later, he emerged, dressed to go out. His hat pulled well down over his face. And his face... What is it? Why are you goggling at me? Your face, I can't see it, or your hands either. Of course not. I took an injection of transparency serum. Now, I'm going to drive downtown, Charles. With this coat and hat on, I'll look like an ordinary driver to anyone who sees the car. When I get where I'm going, I'll take off these garments and leave them in the car. (laughs) Then no one on earth will be able to see me. But where are you going? To police headquarters. With that, John left. I heard him drive off. Then I could do nothing but wait. The hours crawled slowly past, and I grew more and more nervous. The clock was striking eleven when I heard John's key in the door at last. John, is that you? Yes, Charles, come here. I need you. What is it? What's happened? It's my ankle. I I think it's broken. Here, lean on me. I'll I'll help you into the living room. Yeah. Careful. What? John, your, your coat's all bloody. Yes, they shot at me. I nicked my side. It's not serious, Charles. Here, here, let me sit down. Shall I call a doctor? No, no. We'll tend to the bullet scratch and the ankle ourselves. It's a reasonable price to pay, considering that Inspector Long is dead. Dead? Yes, he fell from the window of his office on the sixth floor of police headquarters. While apparently quite alone in the room. And you killed him, too? Of course I did. I had to. Luckily, he had the paper knife there in his office. I was able to wipe all my prints off it. I found the photographs of the prints in his desk, too. I tore those up and I burned them. How'd you get hurt? I tried to slip out of the building again during the confusion that followed Inspector Long's accident. I'd reached the first floor when a clumsy cop bumped into me in a dark hall. He yelled and grabbed at me. I had to duck through a door and lock it. I got the window up and was just climbing out when he fired to the door. A bullet nicked me. I 
lost my balance. When I picked myself up off the ground, my my ankle was broken. But I hobbled to the car somehow, and, well, here I am. John, what are we going to do? Just sit tight, that's all. The evidence is destroyed. Inspector Long is gone. We're perfectly safe. But suppose they have some other clue. Nonsense. I've taken care of everything, you hear? John. I... What is it, Charles? Car just stopped in front of the house. Car? See who it is. The police car. Oh, we've got to act fast. They mustn't find me like this. What can you do? First, I've got to get these clothes off. I haven't time to take my neutralizing serum now. I'll just have to hide. They'll not find me if they can't see. Oh, John, you're ill. I I feel weak. The loss of blood is it's nothing serious, Charles. But but I may faint. If I do. Yes, John. I hide my clothes in the kitchen hamper. Mm -hmm. Then carry me down to the cellar. Put me in the empty storage room. Mm -hmm. L lay me on the excelsior there. Now, if they look in, they'll see it's empty. They won't go stumbling around. Do, do you hear me? Yes, yes, I hear. But, John, I... I... <sighs> he fainted in my arms. I had no time to think. Swiftly, I did as he instructed. I carried him down to the small storage room in the cellar, placed him on some excelsior in a corner, and hurried back upstairs. Already the police were pounding on the door. I jammed John's bloody clothes into the kitchen hamper, and then I hurried to the door. Yes, what is it? The police, Mr. Hardway. We're coming in. Bill, Joe, come on. Yes, Captain. The rest of you watch the house and see that no one leaves. Well, what is the meaning of this? I demand an explanation. And you'll get it. Now, where can we talk? In here? Good. All right, please sit down, Mr. Hardway. I'm Detective Captain Belden. My chief, Inspector Long, was here earlier. Yes, I know, and I answered all his questions then. Well, now I'm asking more questions. Long's dead. Inspector Long dead? But even so, well, listen, why? Listen, Long smelled a rat in that set up someplace, and earlier tonight, when he got your fingerprints, he also got your brother's. But he didn't. He got them on a cigarette case when your brother took a cigarette. It's an old trick. After he died tonight, uh, we found the case in his pocket. Carefully wrapped. Well, what of it? In some mysterious way, all the pictures of the murder prints we took off the paper knife that killed Watson had vanished. But we had the negatives. We made new prints and discovered they checked with your brother's prints on Long's cigarette case. Ordway, your brother killed Harry Watson last night. But that's completely ridiculous. Is it? Okay, we'll see. Where's your brother now? Why, uh, he's not here. He, he went away on a trip. Hiding, huh? Bill, Joe? Yes, yeah. Captain. Search the house from cellar to attic. Don't miss a thing. Right you are, Captain. Come on, Joe. Half an hour later, I knew that further concealment was impossible. The police had not found John, but they had found the blood-stained clothes he had discarded. And in my desk, they had found the diamonds which John had stolen. I knew then I must tell the truth. Well, Ordway... Ready to talk yet? Yes, I'm ready to talk, Captain. My brother did kill Watson. Okay. Where is he now? He's hiding down in the cellar. Captain, that's the monarchy. We looked in the cellar and he ain't there. Of course you didn't see him. He's invisible. He's... He's what? He's invisible, I said. You say your brother is invisible? Yes, that's why they couldn't see him. What way, you know what I think? I think you killed your brother in a quarrel over these diamonds and buried his body in the yard someplace. That's how these clothes of his got bloody, isn't it? Come on, admit it. No, my brother was wounded by a bullet after he killed Inspector Long. That's how his clothes got bloody. Yeah, I suppose he was invisible when he killed Long, too. That's why nobody saw him, huh? Yes. Don't you understand? He's discovered how to render his body tissues transparent. He's hiding down in the cellar now, invisible. I... He's not as a fruitcake. Shut up, Bill. Ordway, your brother is down in the cellar now. Huh? Yes, he is. He fainted, and I carried him down there. And just which room is he in? The little storage room at the foot of the stairs, the one at the metal door. How about it, boys? Did you look there? Sure we did, Captain. We looked in there twice. There ain't a thing in that room but a little excelsior. Right, we both looked. That room is as empty as a busted piggy bank. Oh, you see, Mr. Ordway, if he'd been there, my men would have found him. But he's there. They didn't see him because he took the serum. He made himself invisible. All right, all right, Mr. Ordway. Just calm yourself. Now, listen, my men say the room is empty. Yeah, except maybe for rats. We heard a couple stirring in the excelsior, so we bolted the door after we looked in. 
figured we might as well keep the rats inside. You bolted the door. No, you mustn't. Captain, we've got to let John out. If he's not let out, he'll die. I've made plenty of wax, but this is a new one. Yep, he's got it bad. Ordway, I'm afraid you'll have to come with us. Now, will you come quietly while I have to put the hand... No, you can't take me away. I have to let John out of that room. If he doesn't get an injection of the neutralizing serum inside 24 hours, he'll die. Sorry, Mr. Ordway, but come on, boys. No. Give me a hand. Got to get him to the psychopath. No, no, no you've got to believe me. You've got to let go of me. No, no, no. That's the whole story, Doctor. They wouldn't believe us. They brought me here to the hospital charged with John's murder. And when I kept trying to tell them he was alive, they gave me a narcotic. But he is alive. He's locked in that room in the cellar. And if he isn't let out soon, he'll die. Twenty-four hours is the limit, but there's still time to get to him. Yes, I understand, Mr. Ordway. I'll see to it that he's released at once. You mean to talk? Do you believe me? Yes, of course. Our attendant... Call me, Doctor. Yes, sir. Uh, go get my car ready, will you? We're going to Mr. Ordway's home at once to release his brother. Yes, right away, Doctor. Oh, thank heaven you believe me, Doctor. You'll be in time to save John. You'll find the serum he'll need to bring him back to normal in a green bottle in the laboratory. Well, I'll take care of him. Now, you go back to sleep now, Mr. Ordway. Yes, I will. I can sleep now. I can sleep. How is he now, Doctor? Yeah, he's quiet now. He'll be all right. You know, Doctor, sometimes I can't help thinking. Yes, Johnson? You know, he's locked up here at State Hospital for bumping off his brother. Eventually, they found his brother's dead body locked in a little room in the cellar. But I can't help wondering what the cops would have found if anybody had taken Mr. Ordway serious that night he was brought here ten years ago. <laughs> Mysterious traveler. So John could make himself invisible, could he? But unfortunately, he did too good a job of it. For he hasn't been seen around for a long, long time. That's the trouble with having unusual powers. Sometimes they get you into uh, unusual difficulties. And speaking of difficulties, I... Oh, you'll have to get off here. I'm sorry. But I'm sure we'll meet again. I take this same train every week at this same time. You have just heard The Mysterious Traveler. A series of dramas of the strange and terrifying. All characters in tonight's story were fictitious, and any resemblance to the names of actual persons was purely coincidental. In tonight's cast were Maurice Toplin, Wendell Holmes, Roger DeCoven, Art Carney, and Richard Coogan. Original music was played by Paul Taubman. Broadcast engineer was Al King. Sound was by Hal Reed. The Mysterious Traveler is written, produced, and directed by Robert A. Arthur and David Cogan. Listen next week to a tale titled Bury Her Deep. Another strange and suspenseful tale of the mysterious traveler. This program has come to you from our New York studios. Another program of tense and dramatic action will follow in just a minute. Stay tuned to the station for Official Detective. Carl Caruso speaking. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.
That's our strange tale for this week. I hope you enjoyed it. You can find more from The Mysterious Traveler if you tune in to Relic Radio Science Fiction tomorrow. Or, as always, just visit the website, search it out. You'll find all the available episodes there, alongside past episodes of Strange Tales, all the other podcasts, our Shoutcast stream, and thousands of other old-time radio episodes. And as always, while you're there, if you'd like to help support this and all of the shows, you can donate or visit donate.relicradio.com. It'll take you to that page. Your support is how all of this comes to you every week. My thanks, as always, to those who have helped out. Thanks for joining me today. Talk again next Sunday with another episode of Relic Radio's Strange Tales. Strange Tales.